Hey everybody, welcome back. Mr. G here. Welcome back to the next in the lecture series for Electric Machines ELIC 200. Today's topic is going to be on magnetics. So we'll be covering a lot of the basics for magnetics leading into things like motors and generators and how magnetics play a part. In your supplemental class notes, there are some definitions that you need to be aware of. First one is magnetic flux. Magnetic flux is the total number of lines of force in a magnetic field. The uh, symbol is Greek letter phi and the unit is the Weber. Next we have flux density. Basically, it's the flux per unit across sectional area. So how many lines of flux do we have in a certain area? Symbol is B and the unit is the Tesla. We also have magnetic field intensity. It's the magnemotive force per unit length. Symbol is the H and the unit is the amp turns per meter. All right, next is magnemotive force. Magnemotive force in a magnetic circuit is a counterpart for electromotive force in electric circuit. So such as voltage is the force that pushes electrons along in an in a electric circuit. Magnemotive force is a force that pushes along the uh, flux, if you will, the magnetic field. Reluctance is the magnetic equivalent to resistance. So in every electric circuit, there is a resistance to the flow of current. In a magnetic circuit, there is reluctance, which is the opposition to the flow of the magnetic field. There's also something called permeability. Permeability is a figure indicating the ability of material to set up a magnetic field. So, can a material be magnetized? That is the question that permeability asks. So, can you magnetize a piece of steel, can you magnetize a piece of wood, etc, etc. So the ability of a material to set up a magnetic field. There's magnetic domain. Just like we group together a whole bunch of electrons to call a coulomb a unit of charge, in magnetics it's a whole group of atoms, basically 10 to the power of 15 atoms that act collectively and respond to magnetic field forces. And last but not least is magnetic saturation. The definition or explanation, if a typical permeable material is placed inside a solenoid with the current on, the atomic domains will start to align with the magnetic field of the solenoid. Once all domains are aligned, any increase in current will not change the alignment of the domain, and this material is said to be in magnetic saturation. The permeability of, this, of the material at this point is said to have dropped to a non-magnetic material because it cannot be any more magnetized. So magnetic saturation, if you take a piece of metal, let's say this eraser represents a piece of iron. If you take a piece of iron and you expose it to a magnetic field, the atoms inside will start to line up. Once all the atoms have lined up, this material is as strong of a magnet as it will ever be. So it cannot become any stronger of a magnet, 
so therefore the permeability drops down to zero. So basically magnetic saturation is the ability or uh, a point in which all of the atoms in the material are acting collectively and therefore there's nothing that you can do to cause this to be any more of a magnet. So for magnetic saturation if I did something like this so if I took a piece of iron let's say and inside were all of these iron atoms huge amounts of them and the dots just represent a direction at which they're facing so you'll notice that all of the atoms are not facing the same direction so once this material is exposed to a magnetic field what happens is the atoms start to line up with the magnetic field. The more the magnetic field that's applied, the more atoms line up in that direction. Once we get to a point where all of the atoms in the material, so the atomic domains, that large group of atoms, once they are all lined up in the same direction, this material is said to be in magnetic saturation. Because it doesn't matter how much more magnetic field I have put onto this material, all of the atoms are already facing that direction, so therefore nothing's going to change. It cannot become any stronger of a magnet than it is when it is in magnetic saturation. So those are the terms that you're responsible for. So again there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight terms. So magnetic flux, magnetic or flux density, magnetic field intensity, magnetomotive force, reluctance, permeability, magnetic domain, and magnetic saturation. And through the course we're going to be talking about different ones. I'm going to be mentioning these terms, so it's important that you know what they are. So one of the people that did a lot of work uh, in studying magnetic fields is a gentleman by the name of Michael Faraday. We're going to be mentioning his name a lot because he has a few different rules and laws and things like that that have come up over the time. But Michael Faraday, you realize that magnetism is a natural phenomenon here on Earth. It's something that occurs naturally. He said that we must think of magnetics as a field force. Not a force field, so we're not talking Star Trek. A field force. Now what is a field force? Well we all know what a force is. So a force is um, something, a movement that has acted upon something. So. Um, just as an example, here's a paper clip. Okay, so I am going to apply a force to the paper clip and cause it to move. Okay, so again, 
Here's my paper clip and I'm going to apply a force and cause it to move. A field force is a force that causes something to move without physically touching it. So again, a regular force, I'm going to just take my finger and I can flick and all of a sudden the, the paper clip flies away. But a field force is, can I get this paper clip to move without physically touching it? That is a field force. That's what magnets are, or magnetism. So I have here a magnet, so basically a magnet at the end of the tool, and I can actually cause the paper clip to move without physically touching it. I am not touching the paper clip, yet I am getting the paper clip to move. That is a field force. So again, a field force is the ability to cause movement, so a force acting on an object without actually touching it. So again, here is paper clip. And if I can move the paper clip without touching it, that is a field force. So Michael Faraday, he surmised that we think about magnetics as magnetic lines of force. So I'm going to draw just a standard bar magnet. So he says that we have these things and he's going to call them magnetic lines of force. So that is the field force that's acting on the objects without actually touching it. So the magnetic lines of force, they have certain characteristics. The first one is they must form a loop. The next one, they do not cross. The next characteristic is they repel each other. They must also have direction. So, they repel, they have direction, they do not cross, they must form a loop, and the last one, they have tension. So those are the five characteristics that we have for magnetic lines of force. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and put this all onto one screen here for you. So the magnetic lines of force, 
must form a loop. So what that looks like is it's a closed loop that goes through the material. There we go. They must form a loop. They do not cross each other. There are forces that are acting to keep these apart. They do repel. They have direction. The direction that the magnetic lines of force have are from north to south in a magnet. So these lines think of them as flowing flux or flowing magnetic field and they flow from north to south just like current flows in a particular direction magnetic field flows and the direction is north to south. They have tension. What tension means is they have forces that are basically trying to shrink them in onto the magnet. But since they don't cross and they repel each other, it becomes a nice balance. So tension is basically trying to pull these forces, lines of force, inward. And then they have counteracting forces that keep them outward. So if you think of it, if you think of a deck of cards and you put an elastic band on the cards, so the elastic band actually has tension. So what that means is the elastic band shrinks down onto the cards. But if there were equal forces and we struck a nice balance, so if there's equal forces keeping the elastic away, then the elastic would basically hover around the cards. And that's kind of what we have here. We have forces that are trying to pull these lines inwards, but we also have forces that are trying to keep them apart. And that all comes down to a nice balance. And what we end up with are Michael Faraday's magnetic lines of force. They form a loop. They do not cross. They repel each other. They have direction. And they also have tension. So those are the characteristics for Michael Faraday's magnetic lines of force. So if you take the magnet, there are these lines of force that are shooting out from the magnet like this, and that is what is causing the paper clip to move. So when the paper clip interacts with these magnetic lines of force, that's what causes them to move, not physically touching the magnet. So again, if I place the magnet, I will cause the paper clip to move without physically touching it. So once, once the magnetic lines of force come in contact with the item, that's when we get the attraction. Alrighty. Now, magnets will either attract or repel each other. Many of us have spent a lot of time studying this as kids, taking two magnets 
and trying to force them together and having all kinds of fun with it. I'm going to show you why that actually happens now. So there's the rules unlike poles attract and like poles repel opposites attract that's where that whole thing comes from if I have two magnets and I place them in this configuration with the south pole of the magnet here and the north pole of another magnet here they will attract each other if I spin this one around two south poles will repel if I spin this one around and this one around two north poles will repel okay so unlike poles will attract like poles will repel and here's why if I drew two magnets north south north south and I looked at the magnetic lines of force of each of those magnets so I'm just going to draw two and then I'm going to draw the other one in red just to make it different so these have the characteristics that we just discussed the big one direction so the direction is from north to south so coming out of the north and going to the south. This one here from north, from north to south. So this line is going this way. This line is going this way. Same thing here. Now, as these magnets are coming close to each other, so as these magnets come close to each other, these magnetic lines of force start to intertwine with each other, so they start to react. Now remember from our uh, characteristics they do not cross but what happens when this one and this one get close enough to each other you'll notice that this one has a direction going this way and this one has a direction going this way those two lines actually join as one and the loop it makes joins as well so because they're going in the same direction they actually join up so they don't cross but they actually become one because they're going in the same direction same thing here this one and this one are going in the same direction so they will actually join
and then the return will actually join. And what we end up with is north to south, north to south directions. Now because these lines have tension, they are squeezing together. The closer they get, the more of these lines that join up. And what happens is the magnets get attracted to each other. So again, the magnetic lines, magnetic lines join up and the tension brings everything together. If I was to swap one of these magnets around, what we end up with is this scenario. North, south, south, north. And when I look at the magnetic lines, again, I'm just going to draw a couple. Here we go. North to south. So north to south, it's going this way, it's going this way. North to south, north to south. So it's going this way, and it's going this way. As these magnets, north to south, As these magnets come close to each other, you'll notice that the lines are going opposite direction. So the lines from this magnet are going in the opposite direction as the lines from this magnet. So what happens is those magnetic lines of force, once they get close enough, they actually start to butt heads. And we know that they repel each other. So as these magnets are coming closer together, you're forcing them closer and closer together, when the magnetic lines of force start to interact with each other, because they repel, they push each other away. So that's why, unlike poles attract, and like poles repel. It all has to do with the characteristics laid out by Michael Faraday for the magnetic lines of force. One of the interesting properties of magnetics is how it interacts with current and how current interacts with magnetics. So the two of them are really intertwined. And what it comes down to is if I have a wire, so in this case it's a copper conductor. If I have a wire and I put current through the wire, one of the things that happens naturally is a magnetic field appears around this wire. So if I have some kind of a conductor and I put current through the conductor, what happens is a magnetic field is created around the conductor. Now those magnetic fields, thing, those are magnetic lines of force. They have all of the characteristics that a regular line of force has. They, have, they form a loop, they don't cross, they repel each other, all that kind of stuff. They have direction and they have tension. It's a magnetic field around a conductor. 
What's important to us is the direction. So the direction of the magnetic lines of force that go through or around a wire when current is put through it. There is a direct relationship between the strength of the current and the strength of the magnetic field. So the more current, the greater the magnetic field. The less the current, the less the magnetic field that is created. But the idea is, how do we know which direction the lines of force are actually going around this conductor? So we have what's known as the right hand rule for conductors. So this is known as the right hand rule for conductors. So the right hand rule for conductors states that if you take a current carrying conductor and you place it in your right hand with your thumb pointing in the direction of conventional current as it flows through that wire. Your fingers wrap around in the direction of the magnetic lines of force. So again, if you take a current carrying conductor and you place it in your right hand with your thumb pointing in the direction of conventional current as it would flow through that conductor the direction that your fingers wrap around that conductor is the direction of the magnetic lines of force as they would go around that conductor. Okay, So this is what's known as the right hand rule for conductors. In your supplemental class notes I have created a drawing for you. Again, conventional current flow and as it flows through the conductor, magnetic lines of force will be developed around the conductor in the direction that your fingers are wrapping around. So watch. Here is a conductor. If I take this conductor and I hold it in my hand like this and I'm going to put electricity, conventional current flow from this side to this side so my thumb is pointing in the direction of conventional current. Notice that my fingers go from underneath and wrap around this way. So underneath and wrap around this way. If I was to reverse the direction of current flow, so take the same conductor and reverse the direction of current flow, okay, so now current's flowing in the direction of my thumb, notice that my fingers wrap around the top and then go underneath. So notice the difference. So by reversing the flow of current, we actually change the direction of the magnetic lines of force as they revolve around this conductor. So again, current in the direction of my thumb, so it's conventional current, and the magnetic field wraps around in the direction of my fingers. If I change the direction of current, I actually change the direction of the magnetic field. So the direction of current has a direct relationship 
with the direction of the magnetic lines of force. That is right hand rule for conductors. Now what happens if I take my conductor and turn it into a loop So I've got one loop here. So now watch what happens. I'm going to grab this wire here with my thumb in the direction of conventional current flow. So notice that my fingers are going outside and wrapping in. So outside wrapping in. Now even if I grab the wire over here it's outside in. Doesn't matter where I grab, okay, as long as I keep my thumb pointed in the same direction for current, I'm going outside and then in through the center. What happens if I make another loop? Again, as long as I keep my finger, my, my thumb in the same direction, so current be looping that way, I'm coming from the outside and in. Okay, so if I was to take this wire and wrap it into a coil like this, Anywhere that I grab that coil, again, current is going to enter here and it's going to flow through that coil. So if I grab it here, notice my fingers come from the outside and go through the center. Doesn't matter where I am, the same thing happens. So my thumb is in the direction of current. And you notice how my finger is still always coming around the back and going through the middle. It doesn't matter where I am in the coil. If I put these windings together, close together, like so, if you remember when we had this discussion, about lines getting close together that are going in the same direction, they will start to join. So remember, I had, if I take my finger, so it's going in and around through the center and up and around. This one is doing the same thing. But if I put those close together, those lines will start to join. Put another one, those lines start to join because they're all going in the same direction. So what we end up with is a very interesting concept. So if I take a coil and I put current in the direction, so conventional current flow If I was to grab that wire like this, the magnetic field would go on top and in. On top and in. So over the top and in. Over the top and in. Of all these wires, that's all the same direction. So what ends up happening is this one joins with this one. And then they join with this one, and they join with this one, and they join with the next one, etc., etc., etc. And what we end up with in the end, there's one loop, and then we end up with things that look like this. All around that coil of wire.
what we end up with looks an awful lot like that. What we have just created is what's known as a solenoid or an electromagnet. So, we have a coil. Normally, you wrap the coil around some kind of a permeable material, like an iron bar. And what ends up happening is a magnetic field is created. All of the lines of force are joining, and we end up with big loops that match this one. So now you'll notice, if I put those two side by side, so the magnetic fields are very, very similar. Here we know that they pull direction from north to south. But what about here? We know that each line has a direction. But we don't know which end of this electromagnet is the north and which is the south. So how do we know whether this is the north end or this is the north end? Well, if we take the coil and we place the coil in our right hand with our fingers wrapping in the direction of conventional current as it would flow through that coil, your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic lines of force. In other words, your thumb points to the North Pole. So again, if I had current entering this wire here, I'm going to wrap my fingers around the coil in the direction that the current would be flowing. My thumb points in the direction of the magnetic lines of force. In other words, my thumb points to the North Pole. Now watch. I've got this wire stripped here and this end is cut off completely. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a little piece of tape just so that you can see this a little easier. That's one end of the coil. The other end is over here. So if I was to have current entering this end with the tape, so therefore my fingers are going here. Look at this. Notice that my thumb is pointing to the side with the tape. So the side with the tape is the North Pole. I'm now going to change the direction of current flow. If you remember before, if we change the direction of current flow, we change the direction of magnetic field. So I'm now going to go from this direction. I'm going to have current coming in on this side. So current's going to come in on this side. So I've changed the direction of the current. Instead of coming in on the side with the tape, I'm now coming on in on the other side. Notice that the magnetic field now points to this side. So the magnetic field, or the North Pole, is over here. So the magnetic field has this direction. So in other words, the North Pole is this one. If I enter in on the other side again, there we go, I enter in. Notice that I have the direction where it entered. So if I change the direction of current, I change the direction of the magnetic lines of force. So I change the polarity of my magnet by changing the direction of the current. Now, when I wound this, this is how I wound it. I wound it down the back of my fingers, up the front, down the back, up the front, etc. And it gave me 
a winding that looked like this. Okay? Now, I am going to wind this the opposite direction. So I'm actually going to wind it up the back of my fingers over the top now and then down the front. So this is the complete opposite direction as to what I had before. So now my coil is actually wound in the opposite direction of what I had before. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to this yellow end. I'm going to put current in in the direction of my fingers. So current is coming in in the direction of my fingers as they would wrap around. Notice where the North Pole is now. So the North Pole is actually on the other side. If you remember from two minutes ago when I had the other wrap, where I entered the current, so where I entered the current, that side ended up being the North Pole. Now I have wrapped the coil the other way. Where I enter the current, the opposite side is the North Pole. And if I do the same thing over here, so I'm going to wrap my fingers in the direction, so I'm changing current flow, it's now going in this side, like that. Look where the North Pole is. Okay, so changing the direction of current swaps the actual polarity of our magnet. Changing the direction of the coil also changes the direction of our magnetic field or our magnet poles. Okay, so the direction of the magnetic field in a coil is determined by two things. One, the direction of the wrap. Two, which end you go in with the conventional current flow. So the direction of conventional current. So how do we figure that all out? Well, there's something known as the right hand rule for solenoids. And the right hand rule for solenoids Again, this is in your supplemental notes. Right hand rule for solenoids. It states that if you take the, the solenoid and place it into your right hand with your fingers wrapping in the direction of conventional current, your thumb will point to the North Pole or the lines of magnetic field. So, again, in this particular case, I've got the current is coming across the front and down the back. My fingers are wrapping in that direction, so my fingers are pointing in the same direction as current going through. And my thumb points in the direction of the magnetic lines of force. So my thumb is pointing to the north pole. Remember, north to south. North pole. So that's the right hand rule for solenoids. So that makes two rules. We have the right hand rule for conductors and the right hand rule for solenoids. All right. Current and magnetics. So we have a scenario. We know that when current is placed through a conductor, a magnetic field is created around that conductor. We know that if you take that conductor and place it in your right hand with your thumb pointing in the direction of conventional current flow, your fingers represent the direction at which the magnetic field flows around this particular conductor. And if we change the direction of current, we change the direction of the magnetic lines of force. So, if I have a conductor, and I'm just looking at the ends of a conductor. So I'm looking at the end of a conductor. There. And another conductor here. 
there is a notation that you need to be aware of. This notation, this means we are adding a third dimension into our two-dimensional piece of paper, so our two-dimensional drawing. This means that if this is the conductor, this is the conductor, current is actually entering in this side and going into the board or into the paper. This one represents current coming out of the paper. So again, in our two-dimensional drawing, we can add the third dimension by these little symbols. This is actually supposed to be the feathers of an arrow. So if you are shooting an arrow, boing, right? So you got a bow and arrow. So you're shooting a bow and arrow. If the arrow is flying away from you, you see the feathers. If you see the arrow coming towards you, you see the point of the arrow. So you better duck. So this represents the point of the arrow. This represents the feathers of the arrow. Okay, so the feathers of the arrow. So that means the electricity is going away from you, so into the paper. This means that the electricity is coming towards you, so coming out of the paper. Again, it's a way to add a third dimension to a picture drawing. So this means current is going away. This means current is coming towards you. So if I had two current carrying conductors lying side by side, this one has the current going into the board or into the paper. paper. This one has the current coming out of the paper. We know that magnetic fields are created around these wires because of the current flow. So the question becomes, will the forces of those magnetic fields want to repel each other or attract each other? So do these wires want to actually come in to each other or do they want to run away from each other? So let's figure this out. We know how we did it with the magnet. So if you remember back over here, it's the same concepts. Do the lines join or do the lines butt heads? If they join, they attract. If they butt heads, they repel. So what we need to do is we need to be able to create the magnetic lines of force around each of these wires. So, this wire, I will put it in my right hand with my thumb pointing in the direction of current, right? Current is coming out of the paper. So, conventional current flow out of the paper. Notice the direction that my fingers wrap. So my fingers whoops, are wrapping in this direction. So if I grab the wire like this with the current coming out of the paper, my fingers are wrapping in that direction. This one, current's going into the board. So there's my finger. I'm going to grab my thumb. I'm going to grab the wire with my thumb pointing in the direction of conventional current. Grab the wire and notice the direction of the magnetic lines. So, 
If you notice, this wire is going that way, this wire is going that way. As we, or sorry, the magnetic field around that wire. As those wires come close to each other and these things start to interact, the magnetic field from this one and the magnetic field from this one are in opposite directions and they're going to butt heads. So those forces are going to actually repel the wires. On the contrary, if I have right hand current coming out of the conductor, it's going this way. Right hand current magnetic field is going this way. Those are going in the same general direction. So as these conductors come close to each other, this line will join with this line because they're all in that general direction. So here they were butting heads and going to repel. Here the lines join up and that tension takes over and brings these wires together. The same as what happened here. When they butt heads, they repel. When they join, they attract. So two current carrying conductors lying side by side have magnetic forces acting upon them. The direction of current through each of those conductors will either cause it to repel or attract. So, if current is going opposite directions, you're going to get a repelling action. If the current is going in the same direction through those conductors, we're going to get the attraction. And that is all based around the right hand rule for conductors. And Michael Faraday's laws around the magnetic lines of force. So, our magnetic lines of force form a loop. They do not cross each other. They repel, they have direction, and they have tension. Well, I hope this helps. Everybody stay safe. Take care. And we'll see you again next time.